Um, and I'm so excited that we've been able to, to grow and work together. Obviously, uh, we've done a lot of that during, during this very unique school year. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of the conversation today and see old friends. Yes. Um, we kind of, we kind of go a little ways back, uh, the three of, well, and Brian as well, but, um, yeah, kind of goes back to season one of tea with BVP. Um, but so anyways, um, so we could talk about that for a little bit of how that, um, you, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that little connection in a minute now. Um, and last, but certainly not least, um, we have, uh, Dr. Bill Van Patten. Um, he is the, um, he's self-professed and we all agree that he is the uh international superstar um and diva of sla second language acquisition and he's had two shows before um here in michigan he used to work at michigan state university and uh he had two awesome shows that really put sla i think on the map for a lot of world language teachers out there you just look at all the view counts on soundcloud you know a couple years of tea with bvp and a couple years of talking l2 with bvp and uh and that's about it. I'm not going to butcher maybe a lot of uh, his experiences. He can kind of share with us some of that stuff from the, the first question here. Um, so without further ado, um, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Van Patten. Hello. <laughs> Gosh, I was waiting for sound, effect, uh, sound effects, applauses, you know, yay, shah, you know, that kind of thing. But oh, well. That's um, what post is for. <laughs> that's what post is for. Um, so, hey, so rather than the, Mer the Meredith White episode, um, what we talked about was like, you know, how do we come together as a language department? Um, what are some things, misconceptions that, you know, each side has with the other and, you know, and how there was a, it was very, there was a lot of things we had to talk about. We're not going to review those right now. They can just go ahead and listen to it on the next, on the last episode. Um, but it was very conversational. I think this time around, basically, we are not going to have too much of a conversation with Dr. Van Patten. We're basically just going to ask him questions and let him essentially give us answers and inform us for this entire episode. And uh, maybe we might take like a little phone call or something for some sort of question or something. Um, and uh, but a little bit later. So I guess um, we're going to go ahead and go kind of round robin this. I guess I'll start with the first question. Um, so I don't know what, see, sometimes I just know what to call you. Should I say Bill or Diva or Dr. Bill Van Patten? Like, I don't Dr. know. Diva. You know, sometimes I always, I, I feel guilty a little bit by just saying Bill. But, you, can just, um, you can just call me your majesty. Your majesty. Okay. So I'm just kidding. Call me Bill, of course. Who the, hell, who the hell uses all those, you know, honorifics? Come on, just call me I, Bill. Yeah. Okay. So Bill, can you, bring, can you briefly tell us about yourself? Uh, take us through kind of like where you began maybe and how you eventually wound up in Michigan and now you're ultimately in Chowchilla, California. So, um, cause I, you know, so what's some of your, yeah, your expertise and what you're, you, you know, just what about yourself? So the, the, right. lot, lot, some people don't know who is, who is this Bill Van Patten that we have on the show today? Sure, sure. Um, I'm actually a native of California. I was born and raised in the Bay Area, um, in actually all of the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose, and the East Bay, Fremont. Those were my stomping grounds growing up. And I actually went to the University of Santa Clara, which is in the South Bay, uh, and uh, got my, deg my undergraduate degree there. And then I wound up going to Texas, University of Texas, um, to study Latin American studies and economics. That didn't quite work out. I didn't like it. I was getting ready to move back to California because I didn't like Texas either. Um, and uh, a professor of mine said, hey, because I had a TA ship in Spanish at the time. He said, hey, you, you seem to have like a scientific mind. Um, and it's true because I actually was a chemist at one point too. And he said, uh, we would try linguistics. And I said, what's that? Never heard of it. And he said, it's the scientific study of language. He didn't quite say it that way, but that's what it turned out to be. And I said, okay, what the heck, I'll give it a shot. And so I wound up staying at the University of Texas and studying linguistics and uh, uh, eventually made my way into langu first language acquisition. And from first language acquisition, I started asking questions. This was just around about the time when the field of second language acquisition was developing. Um, and I didn't know there was a field yet that was developing anyway. And so I was asking questions about second language acquisition based on what I was learning in linguistics and in first language acquisition. Then I got my PhD and my first job was at Michigan State University. And uh, I won't go into the details, but after two years, I left and I wound up at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where I spent a very long time. 
um, then uh, uh, for personal reasons as well as professional reasons, I left. I got recruited from Champaign and was was and I went to the Chicago campus of the University of Illinois, and I was there for a number of years. Uh, and then I wound up at Texas Tech for a couple of years. I got recruited down there, and then I got recruited back to Michigan State, um, where I finished up my career. Um, and a lot of people think I retired, but I did not retire. I left. It's a long story. You can ask me that later if you want. Um, to strike it out on my own here in California. So I moved back to California to be near my sister. She actually lives around the corner from me Oh, okay. because you always kind of go back to your roots, you know, blood's thicker than water. Let me tell you, my sister and I are very close. And so it was, it's, it's nice to be back in the family. Um, yeah. And so uh, my background is in actually in linguistics. It, it's not in education. It's not in some of the fields that people think they often associate with language teaching. My, it's my, my degree is in linguistics. Um, and all my research and training was in linguistics and language acquisition. Also, it's called psycholinguistics. Um, and if you want to know more, more about me, you can go to two places. You can go to www.alistbvp.com and learn a few things there, or just write to me and I'll tell you. How's that? Is that enough? You want more? No, 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 no. no. Well, that's, 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 that's good. plenty. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it based, that question alone could probably take the show, the whole show. Probably. Oh my uh, God, the stuff I could tell you. Oh my God. I'm sure. My dysfunctional family, my horrible upbringing. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. No. Well, actually, I'm not kidding, but go ahead. Go. Next question. Next go. question. Um, so the meter's ticking. So, uh, uh, okay. I can ask the next one. Emma, go ahead. And, um, and Emma, go ahead. All right. Uh, can you tell us how did Tea with BVP come into existence? Tea with BVP. That's a good question, Emma. And I am, I, I'm, I have a vague memory but not too vague. Okay. We're all sitting around one day talking about things that we could do for outreach. This was back in my office one day. It was uh, Dan Trago, um, Walter Hopkins, uh, myself, and um, uh, Leanne Spino was there. And I said, you know, I, I always wanted to do something like, how about a radio show or a podcast where people get to call in? Because I, I used to listen to a lot of talk radio in my car on the way to work, right? I, I love Stephanie Miller, for example, in the morning. And so I thought, I'd like to have people call in and ask questions. And then we said, yeah, we could do this. And then Dan Trago started thinking about the um, technical side of things. And next thing you know, we, the show was born. It took a while. It was Leanne Spino who came up with the name Tea with BVP because I wanted it to be about cocktails. But because we were a, a university, I couldn't do that. Um, now I can do whatever I want. But so, so we called it Tea with BVP. Um, and that's how it got started. It's just, we're sitting around my office one day talking about Stephanie Miller and talk shows on the radio and let's do one. Yeah. Um, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, somebody told me, somebody, somebody told me about tea with BVP and, um, her name is, uh, Allison and she works in the Oakland County and she's part of like, um, she does a lot of the stuff for my Willa, you know, for years and years. And, um, so yeah. And then I, I'm like, Okay. So I started like listening. Right. And then I guess the connection between me, you and Emma is that, um, Emma used to for a little while took some phone calls. And, uh, so I would call in and say, hi, I'd like to talk, you know, and then I'd like to answer, or I have a question for bill. And then she, so that was the first time I heard Emma's voice was on the phone. And then she passed me to you and I was a little nervous. I'm like, Oh my God, this is live. I'm on a talk show right now. Um, and, uh, I think that episode I was on with you for like a good 20 minutes <laughs> because then I ended up telling you said, you you want to answer the, the SLA question. Don't, don't you? And I'm like, I didn't want to, but I guess the, you, you wanted to get that question out. So I was it. And, uh, Actually, and I was trying to cut you off is what I was trying to do. I, I, I kind of I kind of figured that, too. Um, so that's OK. Um, by, by the way, just just for, for just for history's sake, Emma was our first and I will say my favorite intern. Um, she interned. Um, uh, at, at, she was working in the Center for Language um, Teaching Advancement. Uh, teaching Advancement. Um, in our building. And so uh, she was looking for an internship, something to do. And so Angelica said, how about we have Emma come work for us? I went, okay. And then I met Emma and I, I fell in love with Emma and I thought she was great. Still do. So. Thank you. And I'll tell you, Bill, that, that you came into my life thanks to being spammed. I just one day got an email in my <laughs> inbox at school and it said D with BVP. I said, what in the world is this? And I 
sure enough and i i you know the rest is history as they as they say so <laughs> it's the one and only time spam has ever worked on me <laughs> brian I've, I've been i've been accused of lots of things but never spamming anybody so. <laughs> I, I think it was my fault actually because i would put out like a speaking my language newsletter and i would just go ahead and i'd find every single world language teacher in every single high school in michigan and um and I went to their, you know, staff directories and I started compiling a huge, massive email list of like 400 like teachers. And then T would BBP would be part of the little things in the newsletter. And people are like, where's this newsletter come from or whatever. So I did like hours and hours of grunt work to try to get like, you know, at least a good, you know, every high school, you know, at least a couple of world language teachers. So that's, it probably came from me. Um, and then, then I gave that huge long list to Erica and, you know, so that she could start getting the word out about Mitten CI. I'm like, hey, I already got a whole list of emails if you want to, like, blast everyone, you know, about this new conference we're going to have in Saline, Michigan. So, um, hey, so, so Brian, do you want to take the next question now? I think we're going to kind of get into some of these questions so that, uh, that people are just wanting to uh, listen to um, care. And, uh, yeah, so what do you think, Brian? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, we've spent a lot of time on the podcast so far talking about, um, you know, how to bring departments together, teachers together with a common understanding of, you know, the principles of CI. So what would you say, Bill, are some of the basic principles about language that every teacher must know if they're going to be a, um, a the, I know you're not a big fan of the word teacher or to teach the language. Um, oh, teacher is a fine word, but it just, it just means things in certain contexts that, that we have to be careful of. Um, yeah, my, my principles are broader than just what's typically called CI, which I know we'll get into in a little bit, but um, it, they have to do with a broader understanding of uh, communicative language classrooms, right? Of which CI, the, what you guys, what you all call CI is one type of communicative classroom. Um, and so these are all, if I can put a plug in, it makes sense. Those of you who do not know, I did a little book with ACTFL, um, one of their bestsellers called While We're on the Topic. And the um, tagline is BVP on language acquisition and classroom practice. And in that book, I spell out a number of principles that are based um, actually on research and theory. We've, we've been doing research on language acquisition in classrooms in a wide variety of contexts, uh, ESL, um, Spanish as a language in the United States, French, um, Tur Turkish, you name it, Japanese, Chinese. So this is not any one context. These, these are principles that speak to all contexts of language acquisition, all contexts of language development. I'll make that clear because there was something that happened recently on a, on a, on a site on ACTFL and people were claiming that there's no research doesn't say, well, actually, yeah, there is. There's an entire 50 years worth of research. If you look at it all in the aggregate, it speaks to this. But anyway, would so, you real uh, quick, before you go on, just, just to kind of bounce off of that, does that include what, what you would say first language acquisition or how languages, first languages are taught in, say, an elementary classroom or even a high school classroom? No, because in elementary classrooms, you already have a language. Are you talking about, are you talking about uh, learning a second language in elementary classrooms, Brian? Which, which, what do you mean? First language. I'm just thinking like things oh, like no. phonics and spelling and things like that. No, no, no. Kids, kids, when they get to that stuff, they're, they're, they get ruined by, by that kind of stuff. They already have language. They get ruined. That's, that's hard. That's harsh. Um, they can get involved in all kinds of things because we develop metalinguistic ability with their first language, but they already have a language, right? So it's already it. Um, it's not complete. I mean, the, the big myth about first language acquisition, everybody thinks that, you know, by the age of five, you're pretty much complete. Actually, there are some rough edges. There are, part, there are parts of your language that yeah. don't... Um, don't solidify until almost puberty in your first language. Um, but you can ask me about that later. Anyway, so back to the principles, right? Because that's what Darren, or that's what you asked me about. Um, the um, principles revolve, again, around basic things from research that have evolved over the last 50 years. Um, the first one is that if you're going to teach communicatively, you better have a working definition of communication, which we do. And very few people who claim to teach communicatively have one. And if we all had the same working definition of communication, we'd avoid a lot of problems in our discussions. So um, I'm not going to give that definition. People can look it up. It's like I say, it's in the book. Um, the one of the second, the, another principle involved is um, the nature of language and that um, to teach communicatively to have a contemporary classroom means you understand that language is too abstract and complex 
to teach and learn explicitly. Um, and I have a whole book on that that I did with ACFL, another little short book called The Nature of Language, which I'll put a plug in for that if you want to go into that in detail. Uh, a third principle involves um, the research, the basic research on acquisition. Uh, and that is that communicative language teachers um, need to be informed by the, the basics, the, the facts we know about acquisition. And there are a number of those I'm sure they're going to come up in discussion here in a minute. Uh, uh, so in other words, so the principle would be make sure your instruction, make sure your curriculum is formed by what we know about acquisition. Um, <clears throat> a derivative of that is another principle, which is about the role of input, that one of the principal um, jobs of teachers uh, in classrooms and curriculum is to provide input to learners, that is meaning bearing language stuff that's part of communication, provide input that is level appropriate um, and also to allow for interaction by learners that is level appropriate. Um, that has a number of implications. We can explore those if you'd like. Um, another principle is um, to understand um, what the role of, uh, well, actually, before I do the one about explicit instruction, let me just talk about tasks for a minute. This is, this is one that I push not everybody would agree. I think everybody agrees with those, the, the first four that I talked about. The one about tasks, not everybody would agree with, but I'm a big advocate of tasks informing what we do um, and saying that tasks should be the backbone of the curriculum. Tasks aren't the only thing you do in a classroom, but they're the backbone, backbone in the sense that they help, they help string things together over time that you're doing um, to, to provide your, your curriculum some cohesion over time, but it doesn't mean you're doing tasks every minute. And, and the reason I talk about tasks, because tasks, one of the few events in the classroom that actually have communicative purpose and communicative value, um, in, in a more complete way. And then the last principle is that teachers need to understand the limited role of explicit instruction, um, in grammar and vocabulary and any, any, part of language for that matter. Um, and the research is pretty clear on that. And so th the idea there and that principle is to limit what you do explicitly um, because it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. We're not sure if it does anything, but I like to fudge and say it might do something, but we're not quite sure what it does. Um, but it's certainly not what people think it is for the most part. So, so the idea is to limit that um, because you've got other things you can need to be doing if you want to foster communicative ability and acquisition in the classroom. So those, are, those in a nutshell are some of the basic ideas behind communicative language teaching and, and comprehension-based language teaching. Perfect, uh, thank you. Th wow. Um, well, th <laughs> thank you so, wow, that's just, uh, that's a lot of information. Um, read the book, Darren, read the book. <laughs> well. I know you have, I'm just teasing you. Wow. What's wow. the name of the book, Darren? Yes, go ahead. While we're on the topic, um, yes. the si six or seven principles of uh, contemporary language teaching. Yes. That's, there's six or seven. There's, there are, there are six. Six. Okay, there are six, yeah. Oh, I, oh, I read it like, um, you know, th that summer that, I know, you know. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I was watching it while I was, I started reading it when I was getting my tires changed at discount tire or rotated rather. Um <laughs> I got to read it again. That's on my to-do list over the summer. And it might be a, it might be a, a copy of it might be a prize for somebody today who's listening. Um, Never know. Yeah. So, um, so Christine came on and um, she, she, her name's Christine and she and I work in our same uh, huge district of world language teachers. And um, so she's now on Christine, do you have those, uh, you have the questions too, right? I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Could I ask someone to change my name? It says internet. Your internet <laughs> unstable is your name. I will fix that while you're maybe telling us <laughs> a, a, just as Brian and I just said something about ourselves, just as a reminder and Emma here for about 30 seconds. So if you want I thought to, that was sure. some, I thought that was from some language I didn't know. I thought, well, that's an it's interesting name. That's an interesting name. You know, Frau unstable. <laughs> un, 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 unstable or something like that. <gasps> unstable. Okay. My name is Christine Ladner and just really quickly, just, I'm sorry, I jumped in late, but I am a world language teacher in the same district as Darren in Southeast Michigan. Love my job. I teach uh, what Emma calls a carousel course. I love the name of that, uh, but we call it a, an exploratory course. We explore five languages and they are French, German, Spanish, Chinese, and Japanese. Japanese is my uh, certification language. 
And then I get into Greek and Latin roots that are in English at the very end for the last two or three weeks. So we basically have three weeks of each of those languages. It's tons of fun. I get to cherry pick all the fun stuff and don't have to do all the, you know, <laughs> all the nitty gritty. So I love the course and it gives uh, my sixth through eighth graders a great opportunity to uh, really feel out what language they like best. So I love that. I have also worked in quite a few other districts, but, um, but anyway, that's me. I'm originally from New Orleans and a transplant to Michigan. She just lazied up the Mississippi all the way up and then- That's right, and, and, I and took, upstream, took a right, road. She, she took a right when she got to uh, Illinois, but there you go. Um, so, yeah, so we're all from, yeah, nice we're all to from- Nice you both and Emma. We're, we're all from Michigan and um, yeah, Emma, Ryan and Christine and, uh, and me and uh, Bill, you were in Michigan for a little bit, and uh, yep. we we dearly miss you. And it's my second uh, home, my second home. Yeah, I mean, you're you're way farther away for me to visit you in person. I remember I stopped at uh, at Michigan State University just in time for an episode of Tea with BVP. Yeah, <laughs> that was fun times. I was like behind the scenes. I still got those videos. Oh, I just I want to also give you know like tell people what's going on on Facebook. You know here. Um, and uh, Erica says um, we used it for book study in Celine. I think she's talking about probably why we're on the topic. Um, yeah. And she, yeah. And so in Celine, Michigan. Um, and uh, what else? Oh, this Roger says after reading it while we're on the topic became my favorite book of all time. <laughs> so Ooh, <laughs> dang. Um, I, I, okay, that Roger, that that Roger just became my favorite person in the world. Um, well, and you have to, can I can I, I have to name drop here too because you know Steve Crashin is a friend of mine. I'm, I've known him for years, and so when I started writing fiction, I sent him a copy of my first novel, Sidon's Tale, and um, he wrote back to me. He goes, "You are now my new favorite fiction author, Bill." <laughs> and so he goes on Amazon. You should read his. He has a one word um, review of my book on 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 Amazon magnificent with exclamation point <laughs> so that was that was great so roger you're right there with steve you guys i love you guys thank you yes i can attest it's probably one of my favorite books as well um so uh, number four I okay we're on number four so it's back to me again so um huh, you you've mentioned this on your show on talking l2 and um you also talked about like i, I remember the last episode was like it was titled will ci survive but we can talk about that a little bit later but um so the question is can you remind our listeners um about what comprehensible input is and how it should and should not be used you know it was, you know, you know so if that makes sense like any sort of like misconceptions about what ci is you know some people might maybe say oh this is just the next passing fad in order to teach whatever um you know throw that in there with the tprs people like oh i used to go to tprs things yeah blaine ray back in the 90s and now we have the ci thing we're hearing about you know i think some language teachers have maybe a misconception as what ci is they think maybe it's just a way to teach something like a certain thing and i think at the same time there might be some well i'm just going to stop there and just leave that question hold and then you can you know tell me what uh how would you answer that question well, first of all, let's just go back historically. Comprehensible input as a term is not tied to language teaching. It never was. It was. It's a term. It's a construct used in second language research to talk about the kind of exposure that language learners in and out of classrooms um, uh, get um, that that maximizes that helps to maximize acquisition. In other words. Um, we learn, we acquire languages over time because of our exposure to languages in context. We don't learn languages by practicing them. We don't, we just, no, it just we just don't. Um, and again, I'm using a very technical definition of language here. If you're out there disagreeing with me already, it's probably because you and I have different definitions of what language is. We can talk about that too. Um, so languages is, is only acquired through an interaction between the input out there in the environment that you're exposed to and stuff that happens in your head. Okay, with that said, um, language that's incomprehensible that you can't make sense of uh, from your environment is just noise. 
and then you can't acquire from it. Um, so it was Steve Krashen who coined the term comprehensible input. Up until then, we were just talking about input and language environment, things like that. And he coined the term comprehensible in input to remind people that, that there had to be some degree of comprehensibility to what learners were exposed to for language acquisition to happen. And again, that's in and out of classrooms. That's in all contexts with your male, female, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, um, whether you're literate or illiterate, uh, whether you have 10 fingers or five or only six fingers, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, but it's true for everybody. Um, and then what's happened, I think, is where mis misconceptions arise uh, is threefold. Um, I'm going to say threefold, could it be, could be twofold, it could be fourfold. I'm just throwing threefold out right now. I'm ticking them off in my head. The first is that um, people think that um, just getting comprehensible input, you magically get language. Yes and no, that's a misconception. What we mean is that you cannot develop a mental representation for language in your head without exposure to input. You just can't. Whether or not other things are involved is another story. That's all, that's all for discussion. But it is, it is widely agreed, if not among researchers in, in second language circles, 95%, I would say, we all say, if you don't have access to some kind of input that is comprehensible and couched in some kind of communicative context, eh, acquisition is going to be minimal. Um, or you can do language-like behavior, but not really developing a mental representation in your head for language, which is ultimately is going to underlie all your fluency and everything else. Uh, I think a second thing that happened is that um, there was a huge push um, in the 1980s. Um, it was spearheaded by ACTFL based on the Foreign Service Institute for what was called oral proficiency. And when that happened, they downplayed all the research from second language acquisition about the role of input and so on. And then input became relegated to this thing that um, didn't matter for quote unquote foreign languages. Don't forget ACTFL is, is, is about world language teachers in the United States, foreign language teachers. Um, so everything we knew about ESL, everything we knew about languages outside of the context of the classroom and, and how we were making all these people like me, were making all these connections between classrooms and non-classroom environments, all that got pushed aside. And so um, comprehensible input sort of um, um, came to be viewed by some as this thing that didn't apply to the language classroom, and that is a, a that is a misconception. And then third, part of the, uh, another major misconception happened, and that that is with the advent of what we call "quote unquote" CI methods or things that you just mentioned, Darren. Is that the term started to get appropriated by a particular groups group or groups of teachers, and now has been associated with method or technique when it shouldn't be. Um, you don't have to be a CI teacher to be to have communicatively embedded or, or comprehensible input in your classroom. I think for a lot of people, a CI teacher means a particular thing now, and that's unfortunate. Comprehensible input is a construct that exists independently of any method, any approach, any, any technique, any strategy, um, any teacher education program, any, any, it exists independently. Um, it's its own construct. Um, but what's happened is now become associated with a particular kind of thing. Um, and, yeah. and I think that that is uh, that's unfortunate and it's a misconception, again, because it exists independently of of language teaching. Right. Right. So that's right. That's the thing. So um, I just wonder if that's just going to keep like snowballing into that, like belief or whatever. Or is there anything like what can people, you know, teachers do to you know, put, well, put, push back that misconception or whatever. Well, this is what we tried to do when, when in 2018, you may know this, I was a founding member of the, a new SIG, Special Interest Group at ACTFL, called Comprehension Based Community Language Teaching. And it was spearheaded. There were a lot of people who were, quote unquote, in the CI groups who wanted to have a, a bigger voice in ACTFL and have a group at ACTFL. And I said, you're not going to get anywhere if you call it CI. Um, and because what you need to do is show how you connect with things that go way back through history, because the concept of input and communication, all that kind of stuff goes back to the Greeks. This is not a recent thing. Steve Krashen will tell you this. I will tell you all of those of us who work in second language acquisition. These are not new things. We only have the empirical research since the seventies, but the ideas are, are, are rooted for a long time in history. Um, and so the idea in, in, in talking about comprehension-based 
communicative language teaching was to show that that um, there's a there's a broad way to look at these things rather than look at any particular method. And I think that's the problem we're having is that um, people hear the term CI and they think a particular method. And I'm I'm trying through using terms like comprehension based schematic language teaching to say there is no one method. Um, and so, um, but there are a set of principles that guide people. And there could be five of us who do different things in our classroom and our outcomes are more or less the same um, because of our principles that guide us. But we may not be doing the exact same thing every day in class um, because um, we don't do a method. We work with principles, right? And so that's that's the push I'm trying to make. And I think that's how we're gonna get over that. Some of those misconceptions about CIs is, is talking more about comprehension-based communicative language teaching and what that means in its broadest sense for people. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's kind of, do you think that's kind of tapping into a question, you know, our fifth question? Um, you know, I'm looking at the time we're at like 536. Now we pretty much started at five o'clock. Um, and uh, I'm just seeing like what we, um, we're Can we not do gonna, number five. Well, um, all, all, all these questions are related. I mean, they're, yeah, when you think about them, they're all related. So they're, you know, that's going to happen. Right. So. R- right. So, um, so this is Bill- not like a vanity fair interview, you know, or whatever. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Bill, do you want us to like kind of go into question five as well? Right. Even though it kind of was related yeah. to, or. Yeah, go ahead. You can go yeah. ahead. If you want to read the question out loud and then. Is that me? Yeah. All right, so here it is. What is, how would you say this? What is Krashen's input hypothesis? And when do you think it really started to catch on in, a, in world language departments? And like, what about comprehensible input? When did this start to catch on? And, you know, it seems like it yeah. took a long time. So why do you think it took so long for these pretty solid concepts to catch on? I am loath. Yes, they to, did. <laughs> I, I, I am loath to give you the Cliff Notes twenty-five word or less version of the input <laughs> hypothesis, but I will do it. I know, and, and, and hope, hopefully, Steve will say that's okay, Bill. That's okay. I know you were under our time constraints, but the input hypothesis has mm-hmm. a number of parts. The most basic part is that we acquire languages by being exposed to input that we can make sense of i.e. that is largely comprehensible. Not 100%, but largely comprehensible. So if we can make sense out of the input we're exposed to, the messages are being sent to us, then we will we, we acquire language for that because we come equipped with mechanisms in our head to do that, right? That's, that's part of the human makeup. We, get, we, get to, we have that nice ability. Um, there are some other components to the input hypothesis, but um, a couple of them have fallen to the wayside and, 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 and I think, in essence now, what Steve likes to talk about is the comprehension hypothesis is, is that but we basically acquire language by comprehending language. Um, and so, and I think a lot of us would, ag- would agree with that statement in its essence. Um, it seems, it seems go- like, do we even have to say that, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, we, yeah, we <laughs> like do. If you're just speaking gibberish, that's cool. You know, it just seems so obvious to me, but like, why didn't that just like, wasn't that an obvious thing right from the get-go? Well, it, 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 it would seem like an obvious thing, but you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. I've been doing this for a long time, how people interpret that. And look at the push at ACTFL, for example, and by some people for authentic materials. Now, if I go to teach my Spanish first semester Spanish class at the university level, and I go in the first month and I'm trying to get um, authentic materials in there, you know, 95% of what I take in my class is going to be absolutely incomprehensible. So what I wind up doing as a teacher is taking authentic texts and doing what I call inauthentic activities <laughs> in order to use those t- because I'm supposed to use authentic texts. So you'd be surprised, right. Christine, there are a lot of people who, who, who you do have to tell them why it needs to be comprehensible. And this right. is why, and this is why in my book, I talk a lot about the difference between talking with learners rather than talking at learners. When you talk with learners, when I look at you in the eyes, Christina, and I say something in class and, and, and you give me a funny look or you nod that you understood you an agreement or, <laughs> or you say, uh-huh, uh-huh, see, see, see. 
I know you're understanding, right? Yes. Um, but there are a lot of people don't understand that you that that that's what you do that 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 you talk with, not at. You don't throw it out and say, oh, just you know, we covered this material yesterday. Therefore, you should understand when I'm using it today. Didn't you do your no. flashcards last night? Come yeah, on. that that kind of thing. <laughs> You'd be surprised. A lot of teachers who actually believe that if you studied it in your book, you're going to understand what I say in class. Yeah. Um, and no, it doesn't work that way. So yeah, it is worth saying all the time because there are a lot of, this is why a lot of people who make first attempts with um, having input rich classrooms um, don't do so well unless they get some very specific training and advice and handholding because they, they think they're being comprehensible. I mean, I used to do, mm -hmm. Emma could tell you this, I used to yeah. do two week long workshops at Michigan State every year at the beginning for all the teaching assistants in different languages. And I have to That's shout, great. you know, they do their teaching demos and then I'd let them do it. And then we'd stop. I go, okay, let's redo that. And I start shadowing them and they'd say a sentence. I go, stop. And I say, I want you to back up. And I want you to think about the fact that those three people there didn't understand a word you said, those three people got one word and those two in the back are tuning out. Mm -hmm. So it's, what are you going to do? It's so tough. It's you tough know, and then. And then, because mm -hmm. they get up there and they don't realize that they're mm -hmm. being, they think they're being comprehensible, but they're right. not. Yeah. Right. So it, it, it's, it's worth talking a lot about. Yeah. So. Okay. Fair enough. Absolutely. And, that, and that's not to disparage teachers. I mean, my God, we all, we all have to learn how to do things, right? I mean, we all do, I, right? Yeah. I do remember my first uh, student teaching, all the kids were a blur and I was just yeah. like talking through them. And my student teacher, she knew that. And she said, they're a blur, aren't they? And I'm like, they are. I'm like, I don't even know like their reactions because I can't see them because I'm so focused on the next thing. Right. So with experience, it becomes a lot more comfortable. But I do feel for those first year teachers who are really trying right. to take this right. on. But right. Because you have to get the feedback. You have to look at their eyes. And, and not only that, but don't forget that that in classrooms that are input rich, acquisition oriented, communicative, and all those things I talk about in my book, it, you're not covering material anymore, which is why you're talking with, not talk. When you talk at, it's because right. you're trying to teach something at them. But if you talk with, right. and you have interesting conversations, interesting stories, interesting things you're doing in class, um, <laughs> then that's much different, so. It opens up this whole new you know, level of conversation, level of engagement level of access that all of your kids are getting to that, which has completely changed as a lot of us are teaching online, trying to, to get the, those moments where you can check in for, for comprehension that are just not there anymore when we see initials on the screen. You know, and, and one of, part of Christine's question too was about um, the, the construct or the concept of comprehensible input catching on. I think, I think we need to be careful what we mean by catching on. I think it's had a resurgence Again, with the oral proficiency movement in the 80s, that, that whole idea fell out of favor of having input-rich classrooms. It, 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 it rose again in the 90s and in the 2000s, um, but it is still a minority, a very small minority way of looking about at language acquisition in classroom settings. Um, so I'm not sure it's caught on like wildfire, but it is caught on again. There's, 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 it's, there's a significant voice of people that are talking about this acquisition rich classrooms now um, and 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 what I call truly communicatively based classrooms there's more people talking about it now than there were 15 years ago um, but we're not there where everybody's talking about or far from that so right so um, I'm trying to think the um, well you know sometimes people you know they they understand they've read your book maybe and they've read other things in college hey when i you know back in 2004 uh in my methods class at wayne state university in detroit i mean i had a book and you were one of the co-authors on it i can't remember what that book was so don't yell at me but uh i remember that was the first time i you know looking back bill van Pan, like and then i don't know eventually i'm like because then i started looking at your books online i'm like oh you know I've seen that name before. Okay. Back in 2004. Um, and, uh, so I, by happenstance, I guess my college professor thought it was appropriate to, uh, have one of the books that we needed that, that you were a co-author co-author and I, maybe it was making communicative language happen. Um, and then we also had to, you know, we watched the 1980s, uh, crash and video 
where he gave like a, an example in German that was, that, that was that happened in our classroom as well. And, um, and we, you know, we talked about the input hypothesis and some teachers, you know, they, they're, they're, maybe they're, you know, their hands are tied a little bit, you know, right. We, that's, that's a whole different conversation we can have, you know, we, we are kind of having on other episodes, you know, in terms of like, um, you know, what do you do when you, when you're having, when you're following some sort of a textbook curriculum, you know, called avancemos, right. And uh, teaching what's on that page 32, you know, even though, you know, all these, like, you know, so, sort of have a sense of these basic principles, there's only so much that you could actually use to put it into practice in the classroom. Um, but I did want to ask you, you know, cause you mentioned this on one of your shows before about ca this catching on. And I think you even said like, like if we just take like the whole like world language departments in the United States, I wonder what's a, a you know, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm just grasping at straws or is that the term of like, what, what do we think the percentage is of world language departments in the United States that have some sort of like, you know, push to have, you know, you, try, you know what I'm saying? Trying to like push, let's, I don't want to say CI because, you know, people are using it for wrong reasons sometimes, you know, like they'll say, Hey, I need a, you know, something CI, you know, for reflexive verbs. What does anybody right. have? Exactly. exactly. Right. So let's just say, I wonder what the percentage of people, even if they think that that's how they can use it, it's, what do you think? What do you think the percentage of people it's or language start. departments in the United <laughs> States that maybe are trying to like get away from the textbook and at least kind of go towards a more input focused classroom in k, through, in, in k through 12 i would say it's probably about 10 percent. well okay. not actually not k through 12 in nine let's say middle school through 12 i would say it's about 10 percent um elementary you find a lot more of that um because they tend not to use textbooks anyway and so they teachers try to come up with their own stuff even though it's still trying to teach stuff at students you find a lot more interaction and input and stuff in in the elementary environment uh, which is where you also get immersion programs don't forget immersion programs are CI par excellence. I mean, that's, that's why I say CI is not a method, it's a construct. And so immersion programs right. are on places where learners get lots of input interaction with, with that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, because those are more academic contexts as opposed to one on one interaction kinds of things, but still, it's still, it's still useful and still good. Um, and in the university context, oh, God, I think you're lucky if you get 1% of the university departments across the country having any kind of, of true um, communicative language teaching with a comprehension-based approach. I, I, I'm so making call in and, and say, no, but that's not true. But that's my guess from watching things online and from, I have traveled all, all 50 states. I hope you all know that. And I've lectured and, and visited lots of different places and I've done program evaluations, all kinds of things. And I think I have my finger on that pulse. And I would say there is no curriculum that is comprehension based or comprehension ba comprehension based communicative language teaching at university level they're all driven by textbooks and what teach what teaching assistants and and young faculty are trained to do is teach out of the textbook mm -hmm. and, and so you know and 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 i mean that's okay i mean that's fine i mean everybody gets to make their own goals for their program decide what they're going to do um, and you asked me a question about what percentage of people are actually doing acquisition-based communicative language teaching that's comprehension-based and so on. Um, are, I'm telling you, are, I think it's pretty minimal at the university level. Are they mutually exclusive though? If someone uses a textbook, can they be communicative and comprehension, uh, comprehensible input base and input plus one and using all those great uh, constructs? They are mutually exclusive. And I'll tell you why, because you would like to think that they aren't but the minute you put a textbook in some front of somebody, they got to teach the textbook and they got to test the textbook and they got to do all. I mean, so your textbook becomes your curriculum, not the see in, in an acquisition based classroom, your students are the curriculum. It's not the textbook, your right. students, their interests, things you want to talk about, things, things that are relevant. Um, that is your curriculum, not a textbook, even tasks that I develop, for example, people say, oh, your, your curriculum is task-based. It is, but my tasks are about the students and involve the students. They're not some preconceived notions. And from one semester to another, I might change some of the tasks around because I got different students or that task didn't work very well because my students didn't respond to it. I'm responding to my students. Um, so again, you know, my bottom line is the students of the curriculum, not a textbook. 
Um, and a textbook will always, always, it's like a black hole. The gravitational pull of a black hole is so great that nothing <laughs> escapes it, right? Well, text, I, I te understand. Textbooks I understand are like that too. The gravitational pull of a textbook to teach that textbook and do certain things is just too great for us to overcome sometimes. <gasps> sometimes, I think sometimes. Yeah, right. Um, see, that's the thing, too. I think, Bill, you you know, you talked about this. I talked about this with you on one of our episodes, you know, in, in terms of like, well, you know, it's, it's the textbook publishers. Right. And they're trying to sell a product. And, you know, it's the new it's another textbook. And then you slap a subtitle, the communicative approach to it, to the same title. Right. And it's all about marketing and this and that and that. But they have to put like certain things in the books because that's what teachers think that they still need or something. So until, you know, maybe like things like Voces Digital, you know, you get, that's got, you know, more story based things going on and people will start maybe. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's almost like, but it's still a textbook though. So I don't, you know. I, for example, Darren or anyone, if you wrote a textbook, like you just like take what you did last year. I'm like, okay, this space, just go take the student's lead and this space to talk about what's current. And, you know, you had those uh, malleable parts in your textbook. It's, it's a textbook. I'm just saying that there could be actually a good one you know yeah. or you could take a bad one and just say okay here's the vocabulary words look I'm not going to teach vocabulary words but we're going to incorporate those words every day you know or we're going to make stories about those words or I'm going to like challenge those kids to uh you know to use the words sometimes at ones that interest you more something like that so I, I guess my point is that you could take a bad textbook and do a good language acquisition course with it or you could even like just have your awesome stuff that you already created and make your own textbook and that wouldn't in itself be bad so I guess that was my devil's advocate kind of point of view I have a reaction but I think Brian's Brian wants to jump in here I'm looking at Brian's face and he wants to say something so this, this really is a question I've been wanting to ask you personally Bill for a long time it's completely uh, yes I, I am single Brian but yeah I wanna, I, you know uh, you know <laughs> that that was for the post show but um so when I think about one of the one of the main methods I guess of, of with CI is the idea of a TPRS and let's just say we're gonna go with a, say a book study okay where we pick a book and we're going to read it together as a class and we're going to use it. Is that within the realm of CI? Because it, and I almost get this is I've always struggled with this because I understand the concepts. I understand everything that you said so far. And yet, you know, doing a book study of, you know, any any comprehensible level reader for that particular group seems like a good idea. And it does fall within that. And I've been trained on those types of things. How does that jive with what you've said so far? I mean, it fits in perfectly with those principles I talked about earlier. Uh, it, it, because let me let me let me let me react to, to Christine something Christine just said, and because this is related to your question, Brian, is that um, when she was talking about maybe getting your materials together and making our own textbook, I would I think we need to start distinguishing the profession between textbooks and books with texts textbooks and books with tasks. I think we have to, I think we need, to drop, the word, yeah. we need to drop the word textbook and say Task book. A, a book of <laughs> what? A book of units, a book of texts, a book of tasks, a book of texts and tasks, a book of, um, because textbook is one of those words that has such a clear meaning to teachers and publishers that, um, that it just, anyway. So what you're talking about, Brian, that I agree with is, a book of texts and it may it may be one long text because it's one long story but inside that i'm an author and i can tell you that the stories novels short stories they're built on scenes every scene is like a unit to me when i write right and so when i, I, I when i teach something that's a story in one of my classes we go by scenes because scenes make natural units okay and you get to explore those scenes and do things with them and so on um and so I see anything that's even a long story um, as a book of texts, or maybe a book of scenes, if you want, whatever, but a book of texts, because within that longer text are all these smaller texts. 
Um, and every time we have a conversation in class, we're right, right now we are all creating a text together. This is gonna be a podcast that Darren's eventually gonna add and put up. It is now, a, it will be a text that people get to listen to and interact with. Um, and that's, to me, that's all good stuff. That, that's what we want in our classroom, stuff like that too. I mean, um, so, so yeah, because you're focusing on comprehension, you're focusing on interacting, interacting with that text. You're not, you're not, it, it's again, um, you're not reading at, you're reading with, you know, when you interact with the text. Um, and so there's, there's all kinds of ways of looking at that stuff that make it perfectly compatible with comprehension-based communic language teaching. So. Even if it's not directly, you said your students, you know, even if it's not directly about your students. Well, no, it doesn't have to be, but it better be interesting. <laughs> it's not interesting because I, I like the stuff I've been writing in Spanish over the last couple of years um, for um, nine through 12 and for university level. I make sure all my characters are age appropriate and age that are, are characters that the students can identify with. And so far it's working. That's one of the things we hear is that students are, are actually looking at these characters like, you know, not that it could be me, I mean, they're not saying that, but, but there's a level of identification because it's not some 48 year old involved in a Cuban revolution or something like that. Well, I can't relate to that, but I can relate to this 19 year old who's in college and going through this really weird experience. That's my, my book, Angel, for example, or Elena, the 17 year old girl who hears the virgin's voice. What the hell, what? Um, you know, and so the, these you find interesting things that people can relate to. Um, and then it becomes about them because uh, it gives them something to talk about and it gives them something to identify with. Oh, thanks. Thanks for validating that because it's something that I've always struggled with. Appreciate it. When you pick up a, a book, Brian, that you don't just read it, you don't just read any old thing that's thrown at you. Don't you select books to read? Oh, of course. Right. So they become part of you and your life because you selected them um, and you can identify somehow on that page. Um, and so, um, and that's what we want to try to do with our students is try to find things that help them connect. I think it's all about defining our terms. Like the, the text that you're talking about, Brian, is just input. And then being able to, you know, work with your students and make that more accessible for them versus that textbook idea, which is like, it comes with the exercises, it comes with this, that, and the other, and just keeping those things right under their definition. And, and, and text can come with quote unquote exercise. I don't call them that, I call them activities, but you know, you can do some things before you read a scene or read a piece of a text. Um, you can preview some vocabulary. You can say, what do you think about this topic? Um, or remember what we read yesterday. Um, so what was the conflict again? So let's care. I got three choices on the board about what might happen next scene. Let's, let's see if we can predict what's going to happen based on what we know about the character. If you formulate in your head an idea about who this guy is or who this girl is, then which of these three options do you think makes most sense based on his or her character? And then, th th and then you, you start to preview things and think about what you're going to read and so on. That's, those are activities that just you know those instead of filling in the blank you're just doing a different kind of thing that's more related to comprehending language and interacting with input so <sighs> sorry um so in case everyone's wondering it's like um i i am listening and i'm like doing all these things we don't have a call handler um i'm looking at mixler aka facebook comments as well <laughs> so i'm like i'm like navigating all these things here um i know that we um i mean hey we're we're at an hour i know that um you know we have a lot of these questions um and i think that um bill i mean i know that we have these we're on so question five, so we, we're going to move on to six, but we have six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And uh, you do know what these questions are. And so it's kind of like, I wonder if we want to kind of pick and choose a little bit uh, over like things that maybe that we really think is, I, don't, I mean, I think they're all important questions, but some of them might be a little bit longer. Um, well, could, could I help out a little bit here? Because I looked at these questions and based on what we've been talking about, let me, let, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Let me like, tell, what would you me, like to address? Tell me what you all think about this. Is that, because a lot of these questions have to do with um, acquisition itself, with quote unquote grammar and language and so on, um, about teacher education programs. And one of the questions about order development. Um, and I'd like to drop the following comment into people's laps that 
in teacher development, whether it is at a university level where you're getting your BA um, or it's in professional development, the three best kept secrets from teachers are the nature of communication, how it happens, what language really is and what exists in your head, and three, how acquisition happens. Um, and um, because those, I, I find that I, I consider those things to be foundational and they're just absent in my mind from most, most um, teacher speak, teacher speak or teacher world or whatever you want to call it. They're just, they're just absent from the profession. Um, and I just find that odd. I mean, it took me a while to come to that conclusion and understand that, but I find it odd. I just think it's odd that you can, you can grab any teacher who's teaching somewhere and say, did you ever study this, this, or this when you were teaching, or have you had a professional development workshop on this, this, or this? And you might get one or two to say, yeah, I had something on that, but I bet you couldn't get them to really talk about any of those things in any kind of real meaningful way, because we tend to work in sound bites. Um, and that's what happens a lot with teacher education and in professional development. So like CI has become a sound bite. Um, community language teaching as a, as a concept has become a sound bite. And what these things really mean, people don't know. Um, and so things like order development, where, where we know from the research, this is, we've known this since the 70s, that, that learners acquire bits and pieces of language over time in, 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 in predictable and, and in universal ways. And across languages, what's interesting is we find certain universal patterns of development, regardless of the language you're learning. Like there's certain things about the way negation works in the world's languages, even though on the surface, two languages look, they do negation differently. We find some very universal things going on in terms of the cognition of the acquisition of, of negation, how it works in a sentence. Um, and then we find some things like you might not think verb endings in Spanish and um, adjective endings are the same thing, right? If you teach or French if, or pick a language that has these kinds of things. You go verb endings are one thing and adjective endings are another or noun endings are another, right? But here's something they share that learners always get singulars before they get plurals. Learners have a facility with singular, that's the default mechanism in language acquisition and which you have to acquire over time is the ability to mark plurality. So whether it's marking plurality on verb forms or marking plurality on adjectives or marking plurality on nouns, I'm not saying they all happen the same way and they all come up. What I'm saying is that when you're learning verbs, you're going to get singulars before you get plurals. When you're learning adjectives, you're going to get singulars before you get plurals and so on. And then within those little things, within those realms of like verbs and nouns and adjectives, some other things might happen that are independent. They're particular those things. Um, but we see this kind of stuff in language all the time. And um, it's the best kept secret from teachers. Teachers think you just practice it and you learn it. And that's, that's just not how it happens, right? Um, and there's also one of the best kept secrets for when I talk about language from teachers is that they tend to think of language as this monolithic thing or grammar as this one thing but it's not. So, so let's look at verb forms, for example, and let's look at sentence structure. Sentence structure is driven by what we call syntactic constraints. So you have, you have in your head things that put constraints on how sentences can behave. But verb endings are parts of words. They're actually part of vocabulary. You cannot learn verb endings independently of verbs, just like you can't earn noun endings independently of nouns and so on. You, you learn those you have to learn those attached to words. Um, and, and so how syntax develops over time and how verb endings de develop over time and some of the things they require may not be exactly the same because language is not this monolithic thing. It's, 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 it's so calm, language is so complex with so many moving parts, um, but we lump it all and call it grammar as though we can use one idea for teaching this thing called language or grammar, but we can't. Like that language isn't like that. It defies. It defies those very efforts because it is so complex um, and all these defies. different parts interact. It does. It defies. So yeah. So those are my those are my comments about that. That covers some of the questions that were coming up. But um, I think I I don't think the profession has done a good job helping teachers understand the very thing they're trying to do. 
and work with. And that's communication and language and acquisition, those three things. We've done, a, we've done a terrible job. And part of the problem is I'm gonna blame my fellow scholars. Um, we've done a terrible job giving basic facts to teachers. And we do have basic facts, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff in second language acquisition that you know you don't need to know, for example, like the interface hypothesis and the interface between syntax and discourse and how that takes a long time to develop and what that means in terms of the way null and overt subjects in Spanish are distributed across blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know that stuff. Um, but there are some very basic facts about acquisition that we've known and that, that have that are part of just general knowledge, but who's telling teachers that? If we don't do it, scholars don't do it. If we don't put that stuff in textbooks. So what happens is there are people do, who do textbooks on language, uh, language teaching who don't even know that stuff themselves. And we get stuff about language teaching where language itself is just absent from the discussion and how acquisition happens is just absent from discussion. So that's partly, that's, and that's partly the uh, uh, university's fault. The, we, there was a split back in the 60s, 50s or 60s between language departments and schools of education. Um, and language departments abdicated their responsibility for working with teachers. And that was given to schools of education. Not, I'm not faulting schools of education, but if I'm a school of education, school of education, why would I hire someone who does linguistics and language? Why would I hire them? That, well, that's, that's over in humanities. That's over in a different school, even not even my department, not even my school, not in the school of education, that's over the school of arts and humanities. So you have worlds that don't talk to each other. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I think, I think one of the best, I, I like, I always, you always brought it up, but I always like the idea of like, um, you know, how does our brain acquire verb forms and grammar in general, you know, and I, you'd always say something about um, that there's no such thing as verb endings and we store them as whole words. Right. And, and then over time, I mean, I think that's always, cause I think a lot of times like with like world language teachers, French, Spanish, what have you, you know, it almost seems like, like the, the leading grammar point all the time is the verb form, you know, we're in the present tense, the past tense, the imperfect, now the subjunctive right, right. and everything else. And I kind of, uh, you know, but we don't, it, it's almost like, sometimes I wonder, like, I wonder what the, were the, the first book that was ever published. Cause you figure it had to have started from somewhere, you know, like the question eight about like, you know, how far back do we start seeing a conjugation chart on a page in a textbook? Because I mean, it, it, it's not what's in our head, but someone thought it was, and they went ahead and put it on there to try to explain this whole idea of a verb form. Maybe it's in a 1960s textbook. <laughs> it's no, the first actually, time. No, actually that, that stuff developed in the middle ages, the middle age with actually between the middle ages and the Renaissance. So we first start to see those kinds of things uh, on Latin and Greek grammars, um, which is ironic because if you go back to the Greeks, a grammar book to the Greeks didn't have pieces and bits of language in it, didn't have verb. I mean, that's not what grammars were to Greeks. Um, grammars were more like what we were talking about earlier, books of texts. <laughs> and so somehow that word grammar got reused and reinvented over the years. And it wasn't until um, the advent of formal education universities um, and then what grammar schools, you know, grammar schools were just basically schools of for elementary kids um, in the 17th and 18th century. Yeah, where those, those I, saw friends take who call it, I saw friends who call it grammar school. Yep. And so, and, and that's where, and, and that's where you start to see these things emerge. So they've been around for several hundreds of years. Yeah. Okay. That's very, uh, I, I, yeah, I think you mentioned something like that. It's, it's, it's a hard tradition to overcome because <laughs> it's also so ingrained. Um, well, yeah, it's 2021. And um, so, um, so hey, Bill, I know you have, um, you know, um, we, um, cause Christine always like shows us a, um, a little tidbit about um, things that are comprehension based um, for our viewers. And I know you also have um, oh, we've kind of missed out on the comedy, you know, um, that you always love to throw in there. This has been kind of a very, you know, serious uh, discussion conversation. It's all the damn questions you had listed here, you know, who can get who can be comical when you got like <laughs> three freaking pages of questions here to go through. It's like Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. I felt yeah. like I was I felt like I was back in catechism class. Like, oh my god, I have to memorize this stuff. Then none's gonna hit me. Right. I mean, if Walter was on the show, he'd be like, you know, sleeping and stuff. Um, or, right. <laughs> I miss Walter. Wake um, up, Walter. 
yeah wake, wake up, up well. so no but but with all uh, with all seriousness again um i you know um i know you have you said you mentioned about cocktail hour and um and uh we're already uh one hour and 10 minutes in here now um but what what, what do we want to establish here as far as like bill when, when do you need to go um, I need to go by 3.30, my time, which is 6.30, your time. How's 20 minutes. Okay, we have 20 minutes left then. Okay. So. Oh, hey, wait, 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 I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I have to text my agent to see what he says about that because how much overtime are you going to have to pay? Him? <laughs> yeah, you got to tell me where to send the check. Um, so he says he says it's okay, but it's going to be a 20% overage. Okay. There you, just so you know. <laughs> There's our comedy. Now, um, so... Man, I'm glad I, I you think, want comedy. I'll give I, you some comedy. I think everybody, all our <laughs> listeners that are going to listen to this, is going to ultimately have like the most serious question, well, the most important question ever for you. Um, but um, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. I think we're going to kind of pretty much we're kind of going to wrap up those questions and not hit on every single one of them because we'll be on for another. Uh, it'll be like the Meredith White hour and 50, 45, two hour show um and christine i do see what you're saying here and i'm trying to you know multitask and enable that for you okay um let's see okay i'm gonna make you a co-host okay. while you do that are we gonna throw out a trivia question while you, while you see, and see that's the thing too yeah i mean we do we do need a trivia question i guess right um i'll be quick i'll be quick oh no go ahead <laughs> what does emma want to say do we want to say a trivia question for people to think about oh good that's, idea yeah that's what i meant that's a great so that, idea do we want so we want to make it like uh, tea with BVP talking L2 base kind of make it simple and not some huge big question about second language acquisition. Like, for <laughs> instance, do you know what the flavor of uh, Bill's favorite tea is? You know, maybe like short answer. That one we've already used. Oh, OK. Or at least that one was already on on his show at least once. Well, um, but this is this show. Well, right. It's yeah. true. New you can do you can do one of those things, questions, see if they were paying attention early on. You can ask them something that I said early on. Right. Or exactly, like, exactly. Where did he get his undergraduate degree? Or, Are tasks uh, the neck bone or the backbone? Or like I wonder the if we bone, could, the right. connected to the thigh bone. I wonder if I could do something like, hey, if you call 586-872-8156 with the first person to answer this question of who was the dynamic duo that was um you know, on Bill's show on talking L2 and T with BVP, who are those two other famous people that were always on the show all the time? First person to call in can get your, uh, uh, you know, a, your own copy of while we're on the topic. Is that, you know, <laughs> we could do that. Um, or Emma had another question perhaps. Oh no, I just had the one I messaged you. Right. Um, you, go ahead and option. Throw, throw that question out there too, right now, Emma. All right. Um, let me pull it up here. So for those of you that did listen to Tea with BVP, um, what building was the show originally hosted out of at MSU? You have options. Was yep. it A, Wells Hall, B, Shaw Hall, C, Hickory Hall, or D, the Law Library? Again, those options, where was the show initially hosted at MSU? Was it A, Wells Hall, B, Shaw Hall, C, Hickory Hall, or D, the Law Library? Okay. So the Where's first grand grandma, that was so long ago. <laughs> Let me see if I can remember. I, uh, I have to kind of look at my notes. It was so long ago. <sighs> All right. So at the beginning of every show. So while you guys are mulling it over, I'm gonna take it from here. And I think I can share my screen now. Probably. But this is um, it's one of my takeaways from, uh, from Jim Woldridge, you know, was like, hey, stories are interesting. I'm like, oh my God, you're right. So and A -A also my dog is really loud. Right, no, no, no. <laughs> AKA Senor Wooly for Senor those who you know so don't know him uh, personally yeah he's Wooly been, bully. He's, yeah he's musically talented Wooly and bully. started out like making some cool songs some cool grammar songs and then he had this epiphany when one time he put this like little two sentence ending in his song sorry that's my dog he put this he had an epiphany when he put this little two sentence throw in at the end of his 
music video. And then he realized the students were like repeating the two sentences with like super drama out in the hallways and stuff. And he's like, oh my God, why are they like hanging on to that and not on to my tu eres? You know, you, you know the, they weren't hanging on to my awesome stuff. You know, he's like, oh, I need to rethink this. So he realized that it's because it's a story and stories are so engaging. Like, hey, kindergartners, here's 10 sentences. Or, hey, kindergartners, here's this, here's this like little short story. Which one are they going to go for? Of course, they want the story, right? So part of uh, my takeaway from listening to him was that, you know, yes, I was doing comprehensible, uh, comprehensible input. I was making everything comprehensible with pictures and sounds and context. However, the story kind of context really hooks kids in. So I uh, have just kind of made that a little more of a focus now and kind of a goal. So with that in mind, I started trying my first uh, movie talk in the classroom. It went over so well, where you kind of narrate through a movie uh, just by showing the stills of a movie. And then you say, you ask them super baby easy questions. And so as you're narrating, they're like, they're hooked in. And you're asking them questions that they can answer, even if they've never heard any of the words before, because they can see the action, they can see what's happening in the story, they can predict what's next, and then uh, they get excited, and then they're blurting out. Suddenly, my D students were the participators. It was so exciting when I tried it. Then we moved to online, and so I tried some online ways to do it. So this is my super duper easy way if you're on Zoom or if you're in person, it works for either one. This is using uh, one of those uh, animated shorts to make a little tiny, um, tiny movie talk. However, I do it a little differently. I do it for absolute beginners and for teachers who have never tried it before. So I just want to show you what I'm doing. This is just something that you can do right away tomorrow if you want to. So. Okay, I always incorporate like a little cliffhanger. So this is the uh, story called Wombo and it's like a German story. And so I just drew a little storyboard and I show one piece of the storyboard at a time. And this is what I say, and you can say this in any language and I'm gonna share this link. So if you wanna also use this link, which is all the way at the end, you just click on here and you can use uh, the actual animated uh, story for kind of like a little reward for good engagement and good participation. So here's how I start. Here is eine Kartoffel and you hold up your Kartoffel in class, like you bring a potato to class. Here is eine Kartoffel. Die Kartoffel ist in einer Rakita. Klasse, that means class. Klasse, is die Kartoffel in einer Rakita oder einem Auto? Eine Rakita oder einem Auto? And Eine then Rakita. The class, Eine Rakita, sehr gut, Klasse. Okay. Die Kartoffel in der Rakita fliegt und fliegt. Oh nein, die Rakita ist kaputt. Klasse, ist das Auto kaputt oder ist die Rakita kaputt? Die Rakita ist kaputt. Die ja, die Rakita ist kaputt. Sehr gut. Oh nein, die Rakita fliegt ins Haus. And then you just go on and you ask whatever yes, no questions or and or, or either or questions, or even you can ask in a more advanced class some why questions like, warum fliegt die Rakita ins Haus? So why did the rocket fly in the house? So you can decide your level, you use this with any language. And then of course the potatoes in this random house and there's a mean dog and I leave it right there. So I <gasps> don't show them what happens and then I say, then that's video. So would you like to see the video? And I always ask that in the target language because heck, they know what a YouTube icon means. It means they're about to watch a video. So if you ask them in the language, 
they are going to answer ya ja or nine or whatever language you're in. And then you click on that. And then it brings up this amazing little animated short, which of course I can't show all of because it is, you know, copyrighted and, but there is a great link to it. So that's what I do. And I have other ones like the snack attack, you know, the grandma's thinking about cookies. Is she thinking about uh, coffee or cookies? And, you know, you can ask little questions. There's money in her purse and make a really easy, uh, <laughs> oh, look at that. Uh-oh, what's going on? So do you want to see the video? And then you click on that video and it's this amazing commercial. So it's an amazing commercial. <laughs> and then uh, Carrot Crazy is another silent animated short. And then you just talk about, okay, there's a rabbit. The rabbit, does the rabbit have one ear or two ears? You know, maybe you need them to know some questions. Does he have three ears? And then they answer you. And you always answer, oh, sorry, you always post questions that uh, they can answer. Even if they've never heard the word rabbit before, you say, this is a rabbit, you know? Uh, and so, and then there's a carrot, ninjinda. So in Japanese, usagi wa ninjin o mimasu. Usagi wa oki ninji no mimasu. So oki. If guys, if you had to guess, what would you think oki means? Means big, huge. It means big. It means huge. Have you ever taken a Japanese class in your life? Nope. No. So you can guess from the picture. It's just make it really easy. Takusan no ninji no mimasu. Takusan. What's the difference between takusan? An old key, you can probably already figure that out. So as you're, as you're asking them questions, they can answer them. So I ask them just like, is this a lot of carrots or is this a lot of rabbits? You know, you ask them questions like that and they can definitely answer. And then you show them this amazing video, which is probably a commercial. So it's this amazing little video. Two guys are trying to catch the same rabbit. <laughs> and they has an awesome ending. Anyway, that is my, uh, my thing is drawing. I love to draw. I can draw really easily. And uh, so I'm just putting the link. I'm going to provide the link. So in case these are things that you want to incorporate uh, stories in your lessons in a very comprehensible way, in a way where students have the opportunity to talk if they want. You're not given participation points for everyone. You're just like encouraging them and you're gonna be surprised that those non-participators are jumping out of their seats yelling because they're excited. They're excited to watch the video at the end. <laughs> they're also excited that they know what they're talking about. So I think that's, uh, that's what excites me. I, I've taught, I, I teach kind of younger grades I taught fifth for many years, and now I teach uh, sixth through eighth. And that's one thing that excites my students. And so I wanted to share that. All right, that's it. That's great. Thanks, Christine. Christine You're and welcome. I work in, she work, She and I work in the same big, huge school district with like, you know, I think there's like 30 of us world language teachers between three high schools and five middle schools. And she, re, but she's in the elementary and what she's doing. Middle no, school. I'm in middle school. Middle school, right. Doing uh -huh. in, in the virtual academy. It's like, right. I don't know. You, you just need to like, you know, come up to the high school with us and help uh, <laughs> and help some, <laughs> and, and, you know, be with me. Um, so, but that's I a tell the high schoolers, okay, we're going to pretend this. So I have that complete mentality. But that's a, you know that's a whole one hour conversation, man. Look at the time. <laughs> time flies when you're on Bill Prozac. That's right. Um, so. Can I just make a comment about what Christine just showed? Because I loved sure. it. It was great. Sure. It, and yep. it yeah. exemplifies exemplifies a particular how you can take a concept, a, a principle of comprehension based community language teaching and show how it works at any level. So when we talk about providing input and interaction with that input that learners interact because um, you're not talking at, you're talking with, asking those yes, no questions and, and getting, and, and, this, and the students saying things, yes, no, one word, whatever, or screaming, ah, whatever they're doing, that's interaction. People think that interaction sometimes means you got to talk in sentences or somehow it's a conversation. Well, no, not in level one. Interaction means 
this in level one and in level five, it means may mean something else. Um, but the idea of, of input and interaction in the classroom is a principle um, that is not defined in any particular way, but it is something that evolves as learners progress over time. So even the input itself changes over time mm -hmm. as you provide learners. So good job, Christine. Thank you for, <laughs> thank thank you. You for allowing me to bring that topic up and put it back into the conversation. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Christine and I, in our department, we're, we're, we're more or less kind of on the same page with a small, small, small handful of some others out of a, out of a dominant, um, you know, the textbook is what's driving things. And I just kind of do the best of that I can to, I know you don't yell at me, but you know, it's like, see eyeing the textbook because i'm going through the chapters and the thematic units and playing the game you know so um so but yeah we have a okay we're running out of time unfortunately and um all these other questions will maybe have to be saved for another time with another guest um and i do know that um and we do have a guest to answer some questions and christine says i actually have to pick up my daughter okay so Love talking to you guys. It was a pleasure. She's waving at us right now. She'll be on our next show, obviously, with whoever our person may be. I think it's Chris Stoles from Vancouver, Canada. We'll be talking about proficiency time rights and everything. It won't be the Fight Club edition. Don't worry. We already talked about that each time. Bill's probably, what's he talking about? Uh, Christine, thank you. I want to say goodbye. Go ahead. Thank you so much. It was really great talking and listening so, to all you had to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's going to be hard to top this episode. You know, every episode kind of got better. We have somebody to answer um, some two questions in a minute, but I just wanted to tell people as the listeners, like some other questions that we kind of wanted to talk about that we'll talk about some other time on a topic about like, you know, what is maybe like the best kind of statement to maybe tell students and parents in a CI, you know, I guess a CI type class that might say that, you know, they don't feel like they're really learning anything in this class because, you know, and they're maybe a little bit concerned about that. Um, you know, this whole idea that they might, they just might not feel, feel like they're learning something. I think sometimes that now, is can I just address that real quick? I can, I can give you, here's what you need to do. Okay. The first day of class, you need to talk to them and be utterly incomprehensible with something that you plan on using a, at the end of the year. And then what you do is you tell them that first day, didn't you say anything I said? No, you will in eight months. Then you come back at the end of eight months and you, and, and you can even record that and show it to them eight months later. I've done this in my class when who, students who tell me I didn't learn anything. Eight months ago, could you have understood this? No, not at all. I remember. Well, then you learned something, didn't you? Right. Well, at the same time, you could probably also do the whole thing of like, here's 10 minutes, write whatever you can in the language in September and do the same thing in June and show 10 words now and now 120 words at the end of the year. There's all kinds of things you can do and, and, and document it. I would videotape it and show it to them later. And you can remind them eight months later. You know, look, yeah, here's where you were eight months ago. Mm. No, we, uh, want, we want to get to, to Taryn. I know Darren. Yes, but, we do. Um, but I just want to say, I also remind the kids too, that you're not learning things the same way you're learning in your math class or your history class. This is different. It feels different because it's a different, completely different part of your brain. I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it's true. And uh, that that maybe makes them feel a little bit better, but I like your way better. Yeah. The, the, the last question, just Bill's not going to answer this at the moment because he also talked about this on Will CI Survive in his last talk in L2 episode. And, um, you know, he mentioned this before. And I, this, this is another kind of question as far as like, um, I think you something we can think about and maybe talk, you can go back to one of his old episodes. Um, the whole idea of, um, you know, the fate of like world language teaching, you know, um, and he talks about, will CI survive? And if like, like something about like, if you kind of keep on using the textbook to drive the curriculum, you know, Bill said something about like, well, then you're not going to need language teachers anymore. And they can just do everything online on Duolingo or Babbel or something. If, you know, the goal is for them just to kind of know the language, well, they don't need a teacher in order to do that kind of stuff. So, go. um, yes, indeed you do. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, um, yes. Yeah, so I on the time. So we're ready to go. We have somebody who, uh, called in, but Hey, we're, this is like zoom live. So we just kind of let her into the, um, into, into zoom and we're going to be calling it a day in a, in a, in a quick second here. Um, so we have a caller on and, uh, Hey caller. Uh, so, um, 
how are you? Why don't you uh, introduce yourselves? Thanks for coming on to our show. Thanks for having me. So I'm Taryn Henderson. I am a Spanish, te- a high school Spanish teacher in the Lansing area and an MSU grad. <laughs> Yay, Taryn. Yay. <laughs> and so- phenomenal. I got the chance to work with her when I was at state. She's doing incredible things. Taryn, you're a published author. I aren't am. You? <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote. She's doing incredible things. Taryn, Taryn, do we ever meet? How long have we been teaching? Did so we meet with you? You visited, um, I was in Ashley's class. So you visited our class. Because you look so familiar. See, I don't forget things. I I don't, I'm not at that point. I forget. I remember you in Ashley's class. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Um, And I'm just calling to answer the question. So I answered both questions. Uh, T with BBP ran out of Wells Hall, where I spent the majority of my time at MSU. And the co-hosts were Walter and Angelica. Yay. Or was we like to call them Angelica and, and Wilson, the volleyball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, and I, I, his favorite tea, I'll take that, uh, Earl Gray. Was that correct, Earl Gray? Earl correct. Gray. Um, so I guess, um, well, thanks. Uh, so Taryn, uh, do you have a copy of While We're on the Topic? I do not, but it's been in my Amazon like cart for like the past like year. So when I saw when it was mentioned that was a prize, I was like, okay, how do I get on? I need to answer this. I know this one. Like, well, there you go. So congratulations, you can take that out of your cart, and if you uh, we'll talk as soon as so you give me your address, and it'll be coming to your doorstep free of charge. Sounds good. So hey, this was a great show. Um, I think um, I think that's about it. I know one of our questions was an important question, which like, are we ever going to maybe have a, you know, a special, uh, you know, reunion show of talking out too, maybe with Jeremy Jordan and Walter and Angelica sometime maybe but, um, you know, I think people are wanting it, you know, it's like, I think uh, at some point, but I know, I mean, life happens and, you know, pandemic and everything else that just kind of, yeah, I think the last show of talking out too came out like, and be- right before pandemic started happening and shut down. That was the last yep. episode. So, yep. We were, we were, we were, we were, what, what's the word? What's the word I want? We were not omniscient. There's something ishent. Predator, predish, pre- what's the word? Emma, help me out here. Um, press, press, we we're prescient. Prescient. That's why we're thinking. prescient. Yeah. That's what I went. Uh, we, okay. Well, so, um, okay. Well, we're going to end the show here. I'm going to, I, I still want to do like the end here. Uh, and, um, and we'll, we'll change this and we'll edit this. And, and, uh, so here's the outro that's already pre recorded. So here we go. And, um, and I guess that's about it. Um, I was going to go through the whole, uh, hey, the, de- the ideas and expre- you know, things on this show was just from the people here today. Not a sponsor of anything else. I think we're good there. I had a whole script for that, but we're not going to read that right now. All right. So without further ado, uh, thanks, Bill, for coming on to the show. We're going to kind of keep this on just a minute when I stop recording here. And then uh, I guess that's about it. I think we're good. So. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Stay tuned for, um, you know, Chris Stoll's on proficiency writing and everything else that's coming up in the next episode in a couple of weeks. And Myra Canyon will be on the show um, as well in a couple of weeks, too, the author of Tumba and Fiesta Fatale. Um, all right. So here we go. Brian, uh, take it away. Goodbye, everybody. Say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Speaking My Language with Darren Way. We'd like to thank our special guest, Dr. Bill Van Patten, for joining us tonight. And we hope you'll join us for our next episode. Stay tuned to the Michigan CI Facebook group for more information. Until then, may all your input be comprehensible. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening.